Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another of our uh, webinars, investor webinars that we were uh, hosting today. Uh, glad you could join us. Uh, we were planning to have three companies uh, on the uh, on the platform today, but um, as you may have seen from the uh, platform, uh, what's the score has almost reached its maximum funding, and so it decided to step aside and give a bit more time to Access Earth and Starfolio today. Uh, but just before we uh, move on from there, I just want to give you a quick uh, overview of where, where they are at the moment. They are overfunding. They've reached 198% of, uh, of their ask. They're, of course, like most of the other companies on our website, uh, EIS company. Um, and so therefore you get a 40% discount on, uh, sorry, tax rebate rather on your, uh, on your investment. Uh, the the company will take uh, a little bit more over than over the two hundred thousand, um, and so there is a little uh, a bit more space for you to invest if you wanted to. Um, it's still open, um, and uh, so but you'd have to be very quick because they will be closing in the in the next few days. Um, and but of course, uh, as they're not here today, if you do have a question that you specifically want to ask Paul, then uh, just let me know after the uh, webinar, and we can facilitate that for you. But anyway, that's uh, enough for, of uh, what's the score. Um, we've had a very busy uh, few weeks, uh, as you may have seen, uh, obviously closing a number of uh, campaigns towards the end of last year. Uh, we also had a very busy time between Christmas and New Year. Uh, we released a Sparks, um, Ireland's top 100 most ambitious companies. Uh, and uh, Fergal, maybe you can put a link in the chat about that, if you could, please, so people can he see that if they haven't uh, already uh, come across it. Uh, if you didn't see it, then um, we'll also send a link around in the uh, follow-up uh, uh, email as well. But uh, as you'd expect, um, both um, Access Earth and Starfolio featured in, in that, of course, uh, as very ambitious companies that we were very happy to uh, to to uh, to put onto the uh, on, onto the uh, uh, onto the uh, list. Anyway, um, so as you know, Access Earth and Starfolio are EIS companies. That meaning, that, of course, if you invest in uh, let's say a thousand euros into the into the company then you it actually only costs you 600 euros as you get a 40 percent tax back from the government because you're investing in a in a young irish business um also uh, i'd like you not to forget that unlike other investment vehicles investing in companies through spark is at zero commission uh, for an investor so you pay nothing at all you pay no uh, commission um uh, if you invest through spark so something worth uh, keeping in mind of course so without further ado, let's get started. Um, uh, just before we, uh, I introduce you, uh, we've all, we always have a Q&A session uh, and there's a Q&A function on the webinar as well. So please put your questions in there, not into the chat, into the Q&A box. Uh, if you put them into the chat, we won't see them. So if you put them into there, then we can ask those uh, after the pres each of the presentations. So Matt, are you there? Can you switch on your camera, please? There he is. Matt, welcome and thanks very much for joining us. Quick introduction George. to Matt. Matt lives his life with cerebral palsy and has used his personal lived experience to create a high potential global business in the process. Access Earth has a mission to build the world, world's largest database of accessibility information. Um, in Europe alone, there are 135 million people uh, uh, with a disability, and research shows that access to venues is the single most important factor for a disabled person to consider before they going uh, before they book a trip. Matt has an MSc in software engineering from Maynooth University, and along with his team, has developed proprietary software that is able to map venues. Access Earth has uniquely and rapidly built up a database uh, of over 100,000 venues uh, in it with this. With this. As confirmation of its SaaS uh, business model, Access Earth has already secured non-dilutive grant aid funding from the prestigious Horizon 2020 programme and Enterprise Ireland. Additionally, funding from the European Space Agency is enabling it to map accessible car parking spaces in cities using satellite imagery and drones. Access Earth has a pipeline of potential grant funding of another million euros available in the next 24 months. Access Earth will generate 80,000 uh, euros worth of, uh, of revenue uh, this year and is projecting a 1.2 after just two years. Uh, the, this will generate a net profit of 860,000. The company has been presented with uh, the Innov Innovative Practice Award at the uh, United Nations Zero Project. And Access Earth is ensuring that accessibility uh, information is accessible to everybody. The global mindset has never before been more focused on creating a more universally accessible and equality 
focused society. And Access Earth has the ability, the ability, technology, and data to bring this ambition to reality. Access Earth is, is already at 77% on the Spark platform. Uh, its pre money valuation is 1.2. With an EIS, uh, uh, sorry, with an EIS of 40%, this brings the actual uh, valuation of the business down to an effective level of 720,000. So, Matt, you're very welcome. Thanks very much for joining us. If you'd like to uh, uh, share your screen, you can get straight into your presentation and then we'll go into our Q&A session uh, in a few minutes. So speak to you in a few Perfect. minutes. Perfect. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yep, we can, Matt. Thanks very much. Great. So uh, thanks very much for the kind introduction, Chris. And I thank you all very much for your time today and listening a little bit more about Access Earth. So um, just before I begin, I'd like you all to imagine that you're outside a stadium waiting to get in to see your team's next big game. And then you're told you have to go use another entrance at the other side of the stadium, minutes before kickoff. And when you get in, you are then told you can't sit with your friends and family because there's no seats suitable for your needs, leaving you at a match surrounded by strangers wearing different jerseys. So as Chris said, I have cerebral palsy, and this is the reality for not just me, but millions of fans who are in need of accessibility information. Essentially, uh, as it is right now, with COVID, there's been a historical low in fan engagement. Combined with low gate receipts due to the pandemic, it's led to clubs needing to find different ways that they can engage with fans and sort of diversify that approach. Even then, less than half of all fans in a stadium find it easy to navigate. There's a lack of real inclusion and accessibility that really impacts the engagement that fans have and feel within the stadium itself. Uh, the fan engagement budget alone uh, generates over $50 billion annually in the US. So it's a huge commercial opportunity that clubs are now looking to really act on uh, with, the, with the, now with the pandemic. Our solution is that from the moment a fan purchases a ticket, they have a customized itinerary uh, delivered directly to their mobile device. This tells them not just where to park, but also where to stay in and around the stadium, where to shop and where to eat. Essentially, we create a easy to understand digital map of the venue so that anyone can see what entrance to take, the lift they need to take if they need to, to their, to their um, own seat. And also to be able to communicate things from the bathroom lock is broken or anything that may impact on their uh, experience when entering into the stadium. Fans essentially can flag issues directly to the club through the platform, uh, enabling them to feel that their feedback is being actioned um, quickly and effectively. The market opportunity for this is um, estimated right now to be at about 15 billion euro globally in uh, the, the global sports technology spend. But this is a growing market and you're looking at at least in 2026 to have a, a, a global reach of 58 billion euro but if we take just the us and eu with stadiums over 30,000 in capacity that's um, an addressable market of over 5 billion and then even just the top five leagues um, within football alone you're looking at an obtainable market over the next four years of 210 million euro this market opportunity, as well as what they're able to do to increase fan attendance and engagement through our solution, will not only increase confidence uh, by providing those customized itineraries for every single fan, whether you're a disabled fan or whether you're bringing your child uh, to, its first, to their first game, or you're a fan who's just essentially broken their ankle and are now on crutches and need to find different ways in and around the stadium we can simplify that navigation process by providing an intuitive digital map that leads people right to their seat. The clubs can then get in valuable insights and data as to how that stadium is being used over time and over a season in order to do things like effective sponsorship and effective advertising to different segments of fans in and around through the entire stadium jersey journey and are able to action any issues that arise at that time. In terms of but like while there are competitors within the digital twin space uh, in terms of providing information uh, about the stadium itself, 
This is usually only done from an event planning perspective, such as in the case of Venue Next. Um, most solutions out there don't take into account um, completing that data feedback loop with fans. And uh, fans feel that they want to have a say in how the clubs run their facilities by seeing the club action their feedback, then they're more likely to return. We essentially bridge that gap between fan engagement and facilities management. And as such, uh, the way we can provide our accessibility data and insights with our solution partners, we help to sort of essentially further uh, augment the revenue offerings in the long term as well. In terms of uh, where we are and where we look to be, in uh, 2019, we were awarded a H2020 grant, which has been worth to the company over 250,000 euro over a three year period. This enabled us to not only develop out the solution, but also to generate key partners uh, within, uh, within and across Europe, uh, as well as uh, in 2020, being members of the European Space Agency Business Incubation Center and to establish our first sort of smart city customers within that year. And last year we developed out our first version of our product that's now ready to commercialize this year uh, with a view to by the end of this year to get 19 stadiums on board and to fully complete out the seat to seat solution with customized routing in and around the stadium. That leads us on to 2023, where we're looking to do a further post seed funding round. We're looking to have 55 stadiums on board in the, in the system. In terms of the pricing model for clubs, they're, um, it, it's quite simple already. It's first based on a setup cost that's based on the size of the stadium in square meters, where we look to integrate the digital map either on the club's website or directly into the mobile app, uh, generating this, uh, enabling us to generate this itinerary for fans. We then give the club an access to dashboard and facilities management data, and that's on a yearly license, which tends to be based on the price per seat within the stadium. Um, we also have, through our connections with the Global Sports Innovation Center, the opportunity to deploy potentially across 23 stadiums in Asia um, over, over the coming two years. This proof of concept for one stadium is expected to be signed in January 2022, but this single opportunity is just a glimpse at the potential um, opportunity for uh, deploying across stadiums worldwide. In terms of our marketing and sales strategy, we have identified not just the key customers, but also the key channel partners in each of our main areas. So for example, CAFE will enable us to get access to the sports clubs and therefore the customer engagement managers of each sports clubs across Europe, while the Global Sports Innovation Center not only enables us to have further reach into Asia and the US, but also has access to multi-venue events like the Paralympic Games. And then, why you may be looking at why the smart city space? Well, in Europe, a lot of the stadiums in and around, um, say, in Italy and Spain, are majority owned by the local authority. So, by partnering with smart cities networks uh, globally, we then not only enable us to have more impact within the local community, but also have direct connection to our customers across Europe as well. Um, in terms of the team, uh, I'm a co-founder along with Donal McLean, uh, who's our COO. Um, we had met in college and have now looked to grow this business now into, into five full-time employees and use his experience as a former senior BDO consultant to help drive the sales and customer engagement strategy over the next few years. Robbie Nolan has over eight years experience in developing AI and machine learning solutions. Um, and is key, uh, a key cornerstone in developing a, a scalable um, product offering that we have in terms of the platform. Uh, Amy Whelan has over four years experience in managing large scale projects in the health and legal sectors and is um, along with Bruno Santana, our, our most recent hire, we have the team to be able to act on this global vision. Um, the speed at which we achieve this global vision is, and this growth and the confidence behind it all comes down to the work that we've been doing behind the scenes. So from the technical work that we've already invested into building an impactful and uh, valuable product offerings to our key partners, networks and sales pipeline, we've been setting this up 
essentially for years. And with the credibility that we've gotten from working closely with these various members of the accessibility community, including national organizations like the IWA or Enable Ireland, um, has meant that we're essentially poised to um, take this out, not just into Ireland, the UK, but across Europe and the US as a whole. Um, in terms of the use of funds, by the end of January 2022, we're looking to close the 250k funding round with the help of the Spark investors. Um, and being a HPSU approved client with Enterprise Ireland, we've been afforded the opportunity to have that partially matched by EI as well. This will enable us to secure key additions to the customer success and tech teams and uh, allow us to further develop um, the product to be at sc scalable and localized deployment across globally. Um, we have the products, we have the reputation, and we have the timing. And with your help and investment, we can enable everyone to access Earth. Thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions. Matt, thank you very much indeed. Well done. Um, you can, there you go, unshare your screen. Thanks very much indeed. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. I mean, you, uh, you've mentioned uh, the, the uh, access uh, into the, uh, the Asian stadiums that you've already got mm. connections with, but I think there's also a, should we say, a very significant um, uh, Dublin-based uh, stadium that you're in very advanced sta stages of uh, uh, negotiations with that you hope to get over the line very very soon so that's something yes. that will uh, be able to be uh, waved from the, uh, the 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 tops of the trees when you when you get there as well so that'll be great when that uh, when that actually lands but anyway listen we've got a number of questions that are already uh, in so can I remind people that to put them into the Q&A uh, section if you've got a question but uh First one is from Alison, and uh, Alison asks, how diversified is your revenue model? Are you reliant on one or two big clients, or is it spread across uh, a number of them? So uh, the, the client size and the deal size really depends on the size of the stadium, but we're not um, dependent on that, no. So really, we've diversified out into, it's not just the, the dashboard licensing. There's also opportunities with the uh, generation of the itinerary for fans. We can go and look at, um, getting further revenue opportunities from local businesses through a verified model with Access Earth as well. Um, but really, it, it's it's a scalable pricing model that um, is not dependent. Very good. That's it. I have a question here for you, Matt, as well. Uh, what strategy do you have to engage uh, users and build a, a community when engaging with the new kind of city or stadium? We do that through a number of ways. So we have partners with um, the disabled supporters, supporters associations within the clubs to help uh, get them to, to because who else know, better knows their community than the fans who visit the stadium week in, week out. This helps to um, further get the word out there into that community, as well as with um, the support organizations like the, the Enable Ireland or IWA. A good example of this is what we did with Philadelphia where we did an initial mapping event, um, including the likes of, say, the Centers for Independent Living and the Paralyzed Veterans of America. And that has now grown from, say, 20 people who turned up to an event four years ago to now nearly 1,000 people who are out in that community constantly mapping and updating places for the, for the app. Brilliant. Good stuff. Um, question about scalability. I think you kind of touched on this anyway, Matt, in your presentation. But yeah, you know, perhaps you can talk about the scalability of the of the of the, of the platform that you've got. So we've we've built this out um, as a, a cloud first. So we're built out entirely on Azure. Um, we've built this from, in, purely from a global mindset from the very beginning. So uh, not only have we built it out so that we can localize it easily enough through our connections with the H twenty twenty project that's across seventeen countries in Europe. So we have key access to partners that enable us to translate the platform um, this year in as many languages as possible. But yeah, we're, we're built to scale from the ground up. Excellent. And uh, what strategy are you using to, to get out to those international markets, you know, to, to get to? I know we had a conversation before about some stadiums as well in, in Spain, some of the La Liga clubs. Um, and, and what's kind of further afield, you know, what sports, what markets? Um, Matt, do you, do you have what coming? So, yeah, as I said, we're focused on sports for the time being through those um, key partners like CAFE and the Global Sports Innovation Centre, where we essentially can let them give us introductions into 
both from a local club level, but also at the higher football association level as well. As you said, there's further sports we can apply this to. Um, but also, like the product itself could be applied to many other verticals, whether it's through the health sector with, um, with, with hospitals or whether it's um, just on a pretty real estate um, market, such as shopping, shopping centers and things like that. Really, the opportunities around this and we, just, we can identify the partners to, to help us get there. You just mentioned uh, cafe there a couple of times, uh, 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 Matt. Can you explain who cafe is uh, for the uh, for the listeners, if you could, please? Yes. So cafe are the center for accessible football in Europe. They're essentially UEFA's accessibility arm. So uh, as UEFA have mandated a number of years ago, each club has to have a disability access op- access officer present within the club. And then cafe are the organization that both train up those officers and also um, audit stadiums for the so for the euros that have just gone they would have audited um all of the stadiums that fans would have been entering to be able to help guide clubs to make it as as accessible as possible so this is not really a nice to have this has actually been mandated from above and uh, will have to be implemented yeah yeah um next question uh talking about uh, the senior team that you have and you know how are they locked in uh, into the business so we have a we have an ESOP in place um, that will enable us to, to offer as we offer share options, um, but also each of the senior team have a have a connection with the accessibility space too. So there's also there's this uh, inbuilt passion uh, to need to want to be able to change the world and make it more accessible for everyone too. Very good. Brilliant. And um, uh, what um, what risks do investors face um, kind of at this time? Uh, Matt, what, what are the biggest challenges and risks that you have at the moment? So I suppose what, what we've been able to do is to mitigate some of those, as, as you mentioned before, is to identify those key channel partners to help generate that marketplace. But also we have the technical experience within the team to build out a robust platform that we can apply not just to sports, but to many market verticals. So there are multiple areas that we can look to generate revenue over the next few years. So we're not tied to just one market segment we can um, pivot as needed. Perfect. Um, you mentioned that you did your competitive analysis there, but are, are there any others that are doing the full suite of options that you're, that you're supplying, Matt? There's currently no full end-to-end solution from a fan accessibility perspective. There are some who are doing digital twins from an event planning perspective, but they don't tie that gap to the fans. They keep it more uh, in terms of the club's insights, but we feel that bridging that gap because um well, on our conversations with clubs and with cafe there is this disconnect between what fans want and sometimes what what the clubs feel they can achieve so we're helped to yeah as i said just bridge that gap very good excellent um i have a question here as well just um in um regarding the mapping of the stadiums are you creating 2d or 2d mapping or how how is that going to look in terms of um the user experience so the first version of the product is a, is a top-down blueprint style map where you can easily identify sort of points of interest like lifts, hands hand tighter stations and things like that. But our, our technology roadmap is to look at the likes of, say, augmented reality. So you can get a, a full walkthrough of the stadium in real time before you get to your seat. So really what we're looking at is, is, is just the first version, but want to be able to create a full a full digital experience which which then follows on to another question we've had Uh, how do you know the map is accurate in real time what happens if an access point has to change how does that uh, then uh, function then Matt so we once we ingest the the architectural drawings or the CAD drawings where they we then work with the club to identify um first the, the the facilities management team essentially that can tell us where the most accurate uh, where 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 everything is from the lifts to the to the doors that uh, fans access through, and then we are we would then train up say the um, the 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 stewards within the stadium on how to use the platform. But it's also reliant on the fans. So one of the ways that we're doing this is we're looking to um, partner with the supporters associations to identify problems and to um, to flag them as they come up and then reward fans in a way uh, with different digital rewards, whether it could be discounts at the uh, the concession stand, 
uh, down to sort of digital merchandise and things like that. Okay. So it's um, excellent. Um, and um, just the if you hit your revenue targets, um, I know this is a tricky one. If you hit your revenue targets, uh, what what do you think the company is going to be worth after three years? Matt? What's your guesstimate on that? So I suppose like we're we're, we're a tech uh, SaaS company. Um, one of the metrics that you could use is your your um, uh, I suppose it's twelve x ARR is generally what's accepted. So even if we look at a conservative ten x, you know we're looking at four million in ARR by 2020, 2024. So that's about 40 million in valuation based on where we are from now. Very good. Um, good. Uh, another question here. Uh, the main focus at the moment is in sports, but what other areas, what other verticals are you looking at? You mentioned the healthcare there around hospitals. So is there anything else that's on your radar there, um, Matt? So it'd be healthcare and hospitals. We have good traction in the university sector as well. Um, and um, sort of large offices and the likes of, say, um, you're looking at the likes of, say, that your your Microsofts or or your um, your Salesforces, who just you know anyone who's building out these new buildings in Dublin to be able to give a better employment engagement rate, you can you know, this digital twin helps with that. I guess like, across kind of even kind of a very big well campus offices, but mm -hmm. also across manufacturing sites as well that are actually over yeah. acres and acres of space as well. But anyway, that's another. Yeah cruise ships there's a whole there's a huge oh, yeah. market there yeah excellent um and then in terms actually question here about the grants um what was the kind of process that you went through to secure them um and i suppose you know obviously it was congratulations on getting such a large amount as well um so it, what was that like matt and i suppose what's coming down the line in, in, on that side of the business yes i suppose the key thing when we were developing out that it was to know that the that the grant was right for us. And we knew that this H2021 wouldn't take us away from what our core mission was and would enable us to develop that, that, um, that product as we wanted it to. Um, and also gave us the advantage that, you know, we were part of a, a larger consortium. So we didn't just, so we were able to learn from people all across Europe. And we, while it was tough to do the actual writing and kind of getting, getting there and then waiting and hearing back from it, that's always the way with grants. Yeah, but I think yeah. once, once we've built out that successful um, history, it's now become sort of, I don't want to say easier, but it is. You have, it is, the, um, you have the templates, you have the, yes. the groundwork done for, for future. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Matt, as always, uh, more questions than we've actually got time for. And I'm, I'm conscious that we're uh, halfway through the uh, the session already. Uh, just one more here, though. Uh, I, find, I find it that it's sorry, this person's written. I find it difficult to utilize the phone in a stadium due to the pressure of the number of people. How how is this? Uh, how are you overcoming that challenge? So we're looking at different ways that we can we can uh, use and generate the map within the stadium. So whether it's you know we're looking initially at the website or at the mobile app, but also um, some stadiums are looking at say uh, large screens um, at say the entrances or at certain points of interest at concession stands to just let people know that they're here. And sort of interact it's a be interactive so you'll be able to kind of then plot your own route like you see in some shopping centers so we're exploring those kind of routes as well because we understand that you know it, it can be difficult using mobile phone in a crowded environment so we are exploring different areas with clubs that we can help with that very too. good very good excellent okay. I, have one, I have one last one chris actually just here that, that's a very interesting one um, and it only dawned on me now as well um, is it correct to say that if you receive the grants uh, you're expecting over the next few years that they are almost greater than the value of the company today that you're raising money on today. Is that, yeah, that lines up, doesn't it? Yeah, I suppose it would in some ways. Well, that's um, a no brainer. But... That's a no brainer for investors <laughs> then. It's kind of like, okay, so that's free money coming in from grant aid. Yeah, and it's great that that uh, grant aid is is available to you as well, uh, Matt. Anyway, okay, listen, I, we need to uh, move on. But anyway, Matt, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. And th uh, Fergal, thanks for your questions. So, yeah. what we'll do now, we'll move on to Ross. So, Ross, are you there, please? Thank you very much, Ross. Hi, good to see you. Um, just a quick intro, if I if I, if you'll permit me, please, Ross, uh, as I did for for Matt. Uh, so Ross Byrne, Ross is a professional rugby player and founder of Starfolio. Uh, he won his first cap for Leinster in 2015 and his first cap for Ireland in 2018. 
uh, Ross graduated from UCD, um, uh, having read in 2018, having read Economics and Politics. In the last 18 months, he's worked with the highly regarded Mosaic team to help develop Starfolio. Ross has identified a new market opportunity with global potential here in, with Starfolio. This new venture aims to become the go-to site for brands and stars to collaborate and use each other to promote goods and services to boost their earnings. They've developed a proprietary, uh, a, a, a proprietary fully interactive platform, which is now ready for launch, uh, launch later this month. Ahead of the launch, Ross and his team has already signed up over 200 sports stars and celebrities and influencers on the site with almost zero promotion. Uh, so, the, so the funds he is currently raising uh, with, this, uh, with this number will be aggressively incre uh, uh, increased. Starfolio is projecting revenues of 2.3 million after three years and a net profit of 770,000. And with their unique offering, they're well placed to corner this large market. The pre-money valuation is 1.5 uh, million euros. And of course, with the 40% uh, rebate, uh, that effectively uh, means that you are buying shares at 900,000. So, uh, so there we go. That's a quick intro. Ross, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. Chris, thanks very much for the introduction. I'll do a quick uh, screen share here. Yeah, please do. Away you go. And I'll, uh, I'll see you in a few minutes after your presentation is done. That working okay? Yeah. Yep, that looks great. So Starfolio, as Chris was saying, it's an online marketplace that allows brands and fans to book their favorite stars. So for example, if there's any rugby fans out there and they want to book a masterclass of kicking with me, if or if it's their, their son or their daughter, or if it's a simple case of they want me to do a video message of wishing them good luck in a game or a happy birthday, Starfolio is the place that you do that. Um, as well as other brands, if it's a a cafe that's opening locally and they're looking for a brand ambassador that they, they may not have thought they would have been able to afford, Starfolio is the place that they will find that brand ambassador. So it's a marketplace where brands and stars or brands and fans book their favorite stars. And for stars, it's a place where they register a profile to make more money through their brand and give themselves more exposure to brands moving forward. Uh, our mission has become a global operator within the next five years, uh, where we see thousands of stars using this daily, and particularly the way the market is going, the way the market has changed in the last couple of years due to COVID. Um, social media is just continuing to grow. The interaction with people online over Zoom, over social media platforms. So Starfolio is going to be the platform that allows fans and brands to reach their favorite stars. All of the IT has been built um, through Mosaic and um, so it's all in-house which is a massive factor for us um, because moving forward every time we add a feature uh, or we add little bits to the actual platform itself we don't have to continuously outsource the money uh, which is obviously a massive saver for us moving forward. In terms of the stars signing up so all they do is they register a profile they select what services they'd be willing to provide for fans or for brands and then it's a simple case of they set the prices, they'd be willing to do them. If they, if they don't like a certain service, they can just remove it. It's very simple. The services range from brand ambassador deals, radio appearances, video messages, masterclasses in what field that may be. So for myself, it could be a kicking masterclass or it could, if I was a scratch golfer, I could say scratch golfer. So it doesn't have to be in your exact field of interest. It's what people would be willing to provide that service for. A great example would be a rugby player who's also a very good chef on the side, which people may not know. So Starfolio will provide this information and all of a sudden someone has a dinner and they have 10 people over and all of a sudden it's a rugby player cooking dinner for those guests. Um, in terms of agents, it's obviously a key question that comes up the whole time. We're, we're looking to work with agents and we're not trying to replace agents. Myself, I'm with Navy Blue Sports, one of the biggest sports agents in Ireland. And I'm absolutely delighted with them. They have, they do all, they do a lot of work for me commercially. And I'm not trying to take anything away from that. What Starfolio is trying to do is provide new and more avenues for stars and for agents. So it's more time and cost efficient for everybody involved. Uh, Starfolio has also built its own marketing tool, which allows talent to geo-target an audience and drive new business to their profile page. So if a star is based in Dublin, but they know that they're going to be moving to London in six months time, 
what, what they can do is geo target London for the next six months saying exactly where they're going. So people in London are going to be getting hit with ads constantly, which will drive, drive people to their page and ultimately which will drive people to Starfolio. In terms of how Starfolio, its revenue model, we take a commission off each transaction that goes through the platform. So we take commission on the stars deal. Um, we charge 10%, which is quite low considering most commercial agents generally ch charge 20% and platforms like Cameo and Yella, they, they're charging 25% and sometimes up to 30%. Another great idea which we've come up with is sponsorship. So obviously you have your, particularly in sports or social media influencers, uh, sponsorship is very kind of by the book and it's generally always the brands who come up with the sponsorship ideas. What Starfolio is doing is it allowing the stars to come up with the idea. So it's a, they can think outside the box. So for example, I'd be willing to sponsor my gum shield. So if brand came to me, why could their gum shield, why could Starfolio not be on my gum shield? And that's the amount of TV time and social media time that that, that action shot is going to get is incredible. In terms of other sports like cricket, the back of the bat, jockeys, but also just social media influencers who are vloggers, who are constantly taking videos, live videos every single day. Starfolio gives these brands the platform for them to promote their deals to the stars. In terms of the market, the market of social media has just exploded in the last couple of years. Um, the US celebrity and sports agency market is valued at $11 billion annually. Um, and even in the last couple of years from 2017 to 2021, the markets jumped from 3 billion to $13.8 billion. Um, and even with COVID, um, it's actually grown even further. And the landscape of the market has actually changed quite a bit. Whereas brands were, before COVID, brands were generally locking themselves into two, three year contracts with stars. Whereas now that's changed. What brands are now looking to do is do a brand activation deal with the star for maybe one month, two months. And then they either, they're happy with that star or they wanna branch into a different market. So they look for a different star. That can throw up a lot of problems as because they have to continuously search through social media, reach out to different agencies. There's fallouts with different stars, agents, where Starfolio takes away all of that mess. Takes, it saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of money for the, from the brand's perspective. At the moment, we are, we're well positioned to be launching in Ireland. Um, we've over 200 stars signed up at the moment and we're looking to move into the UK very quickly. In terms of the team, so there's myself, who I've been a professional rugby player for the last seven years. And as Chris said, I graduated from UCD uh, with a degree in economics and politics. Um, in terms of what I bring, I suppose I know exactly what it's like from the star pers pers perspective in terms of looking for deals, dealing with brands and how to try to position yourself in the best place moving forward commercially. Michael, obviously the co-founder another co-founder and he's the general manager of Starfolio. Michael is the head of business development in Mosaic uh, who built all of our technology. Uh, Michael has also done a lot of commercial deals in the past where he's worked with the FAI, Leinster Rugby and the GA. And Mark Littleton, the other co-founder, is also the founder of Mosaic and he's got a lot of experience in technology and business. Uh, Mark's done some, uh, develop he's done some leading work with uh, massive brands like Coca-Cola, Aer Lingus, Amazon, LinkedIn, and Google. So in terms of the team, we're very diverse um, and we're all very ambitious and we know exactly where Starfolio is going to go. As I've mentioned, we've had, we've over 200 stars signed up to the platform. And the biggest, the biggest factor is the diversity of stars that we do have signed up. So as you'll see here, we've Clint O'Connor, GAA player, Ashley Cole, a digital cr creator, Jason O'Mara, an actor, Luke McGrath, an Irish rugby player, Michael Tweedy, Michelin star chef, Megan Campbell, a professional footballer for Ireland and Liverpool. So Starfolio doesn't just focus on one market. We're trying to cover every market. So we're providing a massive variety for brands and fans to pick from. The platform itself is, being, is fully live and tested in, in an environment. Um, it's live for stars to sign up at the moment. Is not live for brands or fans to be booking stars just yet, um, but we're continuing to grow and we, we're signing up stars on a daily basis. In terms of our financial forecast, 
Um, you can see obviously in year three and four is where we really look to, to take off, uh, particularly with high gross revenue and EBITDA and the same in year five where we're really looking to expand. Obviously in year one, uh, we're just trying to, I suppose, really test the market, particularly in Ireland. And then we're moving to the UK as quick as possible as we have a lot of interest from the UK already. Uh, we spoke to a lot of agencies over there, particularly PR agencies and also agents that represent a lot of social media influencers as they're very keen to use it due to the size of the market and the demand that they get for stars. Uh, and Starfolio, I suppose, would make those agents their job a lot easier as they can have all of their stars on one simple dashboard as opposed to continuously pick, checking different emails, picking up the phone. What we're doing is we're bringing the brands to the agents as opposed to the agents having to constantly go out and look for different, different deals for their stars. In terms of our user forecast, um, as I said, at the moment, we're, we're over 200 and we're hoping to get up to 1,000 very quickly. And moving forward in year three and year four, we see ourselves getting very close to that 20,000 mark, particularly as we move to UK and then ultimately into the US market. We've already had some great conversations with agents in Canada and in the US who are very keen to use it. As they've seen, there's nothing out there that's the exact same as this. There's some things that have been very that are similar, but a lot of them focus on either just professional sports or they focus on just one industry. So that might be just guest speaking or just video messages. Whereas what Starfolio does, it provides all of this. So we're more of a one-stop shop. In terms of the investment term, so we're looking to raise 300,000 at a pre-money valuation of 1.5 million. There's currently, there's no debt in the company at all. It's all been funded by us. And um, we're obviously an EIS qualifying company, which is very important because obviously the investors can reclaim 40% of the value of their investment in the form of tax refund. And obviously investors don't pay any commission when they invest with Spark. So why invest in Starfolio? Obviously it's a, it's a unique and ex exclusive opportunity to invest at a very early and exciting Irish tech company with high growth potential. And obviously we've seen the growth in the market that we're looking to get into in the last couple of years. We don't see this slowing down at all. If anything, we see this taking off more and more as if we look in the last couple of years, how much Cameo has exploded, but how much Instagram, TikTok, Twitch, all of these social media platforms are not slowing down and not to mention even the e-gaming world. That's something that we're really excited to get into as the e-gaming world, particularly now with professional footballers like Jesse Lingard, who are now signing multi-million deals with e-gaming um, e -gaming agencies. So it's something that we're, we're really looking forward to get into. In terms of... Uh, unique selling points for us. So obviously our technology is, is incredible and it's all built in-house, which is a crucial, crucial element to Starfolio. As there's been other platforms or there's other companies who have tried ideas like this, but they've constantly had to outsource their technology and ultimately they've ran out of money. So for us, that's a massive saver. Not to mention the database of influencers that we will have built up in the next five years will be a very enticing prospect for someone to try and, I suppose, take over Starfolio because at the moment, the, the rate at which we're, we're, we're gathering stars and that's all with zero funding has been incredible. And that's all through direct messaging or just word of mouth. So in terms of what the funding will do, it will allow us to really explode into the market in terms of the amount of stars we'll be able to build up on our platform, which is a massive aim of us. In terms of uh, the track record with the founders as well. So obviously there's been, Mosaic has developed for other clients, including Google, LinkedIn, Diageo, and they've also had some good exits themselves. So it's obviously, it's brilliant for us going forward and we're very excited for the future. So thank you very much for listening. And if there's any other questions, uh, I'd be delighted to answer them. Ross, thanks very much indeed. Yes, lots here. So uh, we'll get cracking into them. Um, could you uh, elaborate on the special features that the platform has and, and, and why it might be attractive to both stars and companies uh, on that? Yeah, so obviously the, the special features are very important to us. And in terms of the whole platform is the aim that we've gone with is it's built by stars for stars. So it's incredibly easy to use. It's free flowing from a star perspective, also from a brand and a fan perspective. We've got little features coming up like partnerships. So it could be someone who works 
in the sports industry. So it could be a star and they can align themselves with someone who's maybe a chef or an actor, or it could be a rugby player and a Gaelic player putting, pitting themselves together. And then a brand or fans can go and I suppose select that service. Um, as well as we've another a lot of other little features that we're kind of holding back at the moment, but we're very excited for. Great. Um, hi, Ross. Um, just a question here on the marketing. Um, so, how much have you spent on the marketing to date, um, and, and you know how much did it cost to get the two hundred stars initially to sign up on the platform? So, all the stars so far have been signed up uh, just through direct messaging. So, we haven't done any marketing yet. Uh, we actually have 250 stars now signed up and it's just being us reaching out to them, explaining what Starfolio is um, or else it's word of mouth from different stars talking to other stars. Um, and they're very excited. Uh, we've got a lot of them coming back to us saying, when are you live? Um, so particularly even a couple of we've a lot of stars actually signed up from the UK already who are very excited about it. Excellent. So is the UK the next stop after Ireland? Uh, is that where your intent next intention is then, uh, Ross? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously we're going to be live here first um, and then we're trying to get to the UK as quick as possible. As I was saying, it's not just stars, but it's also agencies who are very keen uh, for us to get over there and get into the market. And with regards to the agencies being keen, um, yeah, what in engagement have you had so far with those then? Uh, for them, I suppose they just see it as another avenue for them in terms of promoting their stars um, and particularly deal flow. So as I was saying, COVID has changed the landscape of the market a little bit. Um, and for them, they're not getting the same guarantee of deals. So what we're doing is we're, we're bringing them more deals, but particularly we're bringing them brands that they may have never dealt with before. So a lot of agencies will have very good relationships with a, maybe two or three very big brands. And they'll maintain those relationships over a couple of years. But what we're going to be doing is bringing them potentially 10 smaller brands and they can have 10 deals over the course of that year as opposed to just having three deals. Very good. Excellent. Um, some questions here around, regarding the, the brands themselves as well. Um, what, do you, uh, what do you think would be the typical brand that will use um, the service? Would it be like large, you know, the large internationals, the Coca-Colas, um, the Vivas, the Alliances of the world? Or will it be something kind of more appealing to the small and medium sized enterprises. Now, I, I, I spoke to actually a pharmacy group in, in the West of Ireland and, and they're very interested in this as well. So what, what's your ideal customer, I suppose, um, Ross? It'll be a bit of both. Um, so we've spoke to some massive brands. We spoke to um, Pentland who own Canterbury Speedo. Uh, so they're a great example. So obviously they're, they're both, they're associated with sports traditionally. Um, and they said to us that, we're looking to get into different markets and we've no way of really doing it. And they actually gave an example of if there was a, a DJ on Starfolio um, and the DJ said, oh, I, I, I play tag rugby. Uh, this, is, and they go, this is the exact way we would get into that market. So that's, I suppose, from a bigger brand perspective, this is exactly how they would branch into different markets that they would not normally be associated with. But as you also mentioned, if it's the local pharmacy, and they're looking for a brand ambassador, they're looking for the local GEA player and they've no way of getting in contact with them or they're not sure about their price. Starfolio is the platform that's going to provide that. And a lot of times for local businesses or local startups, they always think that stars are going to be out of their price range. Whereas I suppose what Starfolio will do is it'll say exactly how much the, the business will be willing to spend and it'll give them the list of stars that's going to be in their price range. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, is it a single website app interface for both brands and the uh, and the the the, the stars? Um, so you know that that's the that's the question here from Eric. Yeah. So obviously at the moment, um, it's just the stars can just register a profile, so brands can't log on and fans can't log on, and stars will have their own back end of the profile, and then when brands and fans log on, they will obviously see what the stars profile is in terms of the services they'll be they'll be providing, the prices they'll be providing. Um, and any kind of uh, gallery work in terms of if they've done previous photo shoots or anything like that. Okay, but it's a single, it's a single app. It's a no single, different. single app. Yeah, yeah single app. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. Brilliant. And then in terms of the 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 split, I suppose, and the the influencer side of the business, do you see those growing more? Obviously, than on the influencer side, or what kind of growth rates do you can you can you see um, on that side of the business, Ross? Yeah, the influencer market is is just exploded really in the last couple of years um, and it's absolutely huge and the influencers are very excited because for them they're constantly looking to grow their brand they're always looking to 
to scale. And it's exactly what we want to do as well. So by them using Starfolio, it's going to grow Starfolio. And we're hoping to help them grow as well. So we're both looking to help each other. Excellent. I think you answered this earlier on, Ross, but uh, how much debt is in the business? How much debt is the business carrying at the moment? Yeah, no, there's there's absolutely no debt in the company at all so far. Um, so it's all been funded by us. Good. Brilliant. And uh, just uh, one here on, um, let me check this one. Yeah, and it's spending the money um, that you're raising. Is there much more investment to be made into the IT or the platform or is it ready to go? Ross? No, no the, IT, the IT is only a couple of weeks away. Um, from being ready so uh, where a lot of the money will go in terms of the funding will be towards marketing so we want to we obviously have a big marketing budget um, and also we're looking to hire uh, two staff members which is obviously going to be very important moving forward and um, with the marketing and with sales excellent okay uh, if you achieve your financial projections over the next three years what do you think the valuation of the company will be at that time compared to today yeah, so all going to plan um, and hitting all the projections. Uh, in three years' time, the company will be valued at 15 million. Which actually kind of ties into another question here. Um, can you confirm what the turnover is for uh, for year five? Did you have year five out? Uh, I think you did, didn't you? Ross? Yeah, so year five, the gross revenue, uh, we're looking at 27 million. Good. Thanks. Excellent. And uh, the same question is asked um, as to Matt as well. Um, what are the risks that, that investors are facing? You know, what, what are the challenges or risks that, that they have if they come in today? Yeah, well, obviously, we've looked at trying to mitigate a lot of these risks. Um, and a couple of key things are obviously we're EIS qualified, which is, I suppose, every investor loves to hear that. Um, another vital element, which I've met, mentioned a few times, is that all of the technology is built in-house. So for us, we, we don't have to keep outsourcing it. So that's obviously going to save us a lot of money and obviously the data in terms of the number of stars that we're building up over a period of time is enormous and no one else is doing that great stuff um okay last couple of questions why do you believe another company would be interested in buying you what uh, yeah, what why do you think there's or how do you think that exit's going to come about and who might that be i suppose i just touched on it a little bit there in terms of uh, obviously the technology is, is ours it's built in-house but also the, the number of stars that we will have built up on our on our platform and how easy it's going to be used for stars and brands and in terms of there's no other company that has that there's a few social media kind of agencies out there but what they do is they just provide numbers in terms of engagement numbers but what we we will actually have built up is the actual access to these stars Chris, uh, I, I have one last one here, I think, Chris, just on the, the fans see the prices um, of all services offered. Um, you know, will they? what if someone doesn't want to share their prices? Like you have Killian O'Connor in Mayo, you have Dean Rock in Dublin, and, and one of them is charging 500 or, you know, the two different prices. So how, how is the pricing going to work, um, Ross? So in terms of that's it's something that stars have actually said to us. And what we want to do is we want to protect stars brand. So if someone is to log on to Starfolio and they're going to my platform, it's not going to say the exact price that I am offering. What will happen is if, if a brand or a fan goes on looking for, let's just say if Dean Rock's on the platform and they're looking to spend between 100 euro and 500 euro of Dean Rock's outside of that price range, he won't come up in that search filter. Whereas if he's in that price range, he will come up. up. Okay, yeah. brilliant. Excellent. Very good. Okay, listen, Ross, thank you very much for all of those. Uh, Fergal, thanks for asking those questions. So I think we'll thank just uh, wrap it up at that. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, so everybody, um, both Access Earth and Starfolio are obviously still on the platform and uh, taking in open for investment. I'll just confirm that the, the investors pay zero uh, commission on the site. And of course, both are EIS companies, which we've mentioned a number of times now on the call. So so, uh, so please, thanks very much indeed for, for everybody's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, attendance and uh, listening to this. And uh, we'll see you again very shortly. But if anyone has any questions that they want to ask offline, please uh, let me know and we can fire them through to Matt and to Ross. So, uh, but thanks very much indeed. And thanks very much. Cheers. Bye-bye.